from Studio 13 in California. You're listening to Wild Card with your hosts, John. You know, show like Moonshiners and this. How do these people do illegal acts on camera and not get caught? And Connor. Has he won Emmys? Shit, I should have been here. A show both liberals and conservatives can agree is mediocre at best. Hello and welcome to this episode of Wild Card. When Connor and I envisioned this show, we knew that it could be more than just making fun of the steaming pile of garbage that is Jake Paul or discussing in far too much detail whatever highly contagious skin disorder Connor is currently battling. We want to take you behind the scenes of people that have interesting jobs, lives, or careers. As many of you know, in the early 2000s, I was on NBC's The Apprentice, which also involved the now president of the United States, Donald Trump. Here's a refresh. John, you made some bad decisions. I did. And you admit that you made some bad decisions. And I think you're going to be a tremendous success someday. I really believe that. John, you're fired. I think John's outstanding, I have to tell you. I hate firing people that are that good. But we had no choice. I mean, he just made too many bad decisions this time. One of the people in the control room while I was fired was NBC producer Bill Pruitt. Bill's been a staple of reality TV for almost two decades, and he has the Emmys to prove it, working on shows like The Amazing Race, The Apprentice, Deadliest Catch, and many, many more. And while Bill's life alone makes for a fascinating interview, he actually made some national news recently when he sent out a tweet talking about the hidden Trump tapes. You see, when Bill was on The Apprentice, so was Donald Trump. And when you're on a reality show, they record audio almost continuously. This means that everything that Donald Trump said was on tape. Now, these tapes may never be released, but Bill talks about the kinds of things he heard the president of the United States say. Like Trump or not, it's a fascinating interview. Bill talks about how when they started filming The Apprentice, Donald Trump's businesses were actually in a lot of financial trouble, and they had to kind of prop this guy up to look like a billionaire, even though he was close to bankrupt. For example, the helicopter in the opening scenes of The Apprentice, they didn't know from day to day if Trump was still going to have it because it was up for sale. So put your protest signs up, your MAGA hats on, because you can grab this episode of Wild Card anywhere you want. This is the point where normally I would introduce my co-host, but unfortunately I am flying solo today. Connor emailed me, or should I say texted me, at about 1.30 in the morning. He's got a decent excuse, but it's still unacceptable. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but Connor is uh, in politics in San Francisco, and he has worked for or worked with London Breed for a number of years. London was actually running for mayor of San Francisco and was winning last night. I think about um, midnight, there were some semi-congratulatory posts And then it kind of all went off the rails, and their opponent, Leno, now by morning is winning. And so I think they were up all night, and he is very despondent and very depressed. Regardless, we have got a fantastic show today. I am super, super excited for the guests that we have joining us. Uh, Somebody that I've wanted to have on the show really from the moment that uh, we talked about doing this. You may not know him by name, but you certainly know his work unless you've been living under a rock for the last 20 years. His name is Bill Pruitt. He is an Emmy winning, or should I say multi Emmy winning, I don't want to sell you short, uh, winning producer, director. His list of credits is too long for me to read, but we've got Amazing Race, Deadliest Catch, The Apprentice, which is where we met. Uh, Weed People, Swamp People, Eat the World with Emeril Lagasse, Outpost, and, you know, the list goes on. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, John. You know, the mayor of San Francisco has led to gubernatorial candidates, as you know. And uh, so it's a big deal, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He's worked really, really hard on it. And uh, I know it's something that he's definitely um, despondent over. And I know it was a big win originally, but, you know, they'll live to fight another day. So anyway, it'll be good to have him back yeah. uh, eventually. You know, I was going to ask you, I mean, it, where do you keep the Emmys? I can see some there in an office. That's got to feel really, really good. See, I'm not one of these people that's evolved and thinks that it would be that, that awards don't mean anything. I'm one of those more shallow people where I would absolutely love for my title to involve Emmy winning. That's got to feel pretty good. Yeah, I mean, my son's uh, 
maybe we're too young to really appreciate what it truly means, which is not that much. <laughs> when he was younger, my son was out at a uh, off-campus uh, excursion to uh, a local aquarium with some of his classmates, and I heard him bragging to some of them that his dad has an Emmy. My dad has an Emmy, and I thought, well, okay, that's something. <laughs> um, and the party's pretty good, too, to get to go to the Yeah, Emmy. what is that like? I mean, when you... Obviously, I want to jump into your background more, but first of all, going to the Emmys has got to be pretty exciting. But did you show up? Did you have a speech prepared or anything like that? Or were you just kind of like, oh, you know, it's probably not going to happen, so I won't worry about it? I'll tell you, it's always so freaking hot. You show up at the Shrine Auditorium and you walk the red carpet and there's, you know, Kiefer Sutherland, you know, and there's all these, you know, famous people walking around and it's blistering hot. (laughs) It's always in September for some reason, it just seems to be, you know, unnaturally uh, warm out and everyone's in their finery trying to look their best as they're sweating profusely. Oh, that's the worst. I hate being dressed in a suit and you're just pouring sweat. Yeah. And, you're trying, and then you're, these are pictures that are, you know, going to live on for a long time. So you definitely don't want to just look like a like a, a sweaty meth head coming down off off their high. <laughs> exactly. Let me ask this. When you when you came to Hollywood did you always have TV in mind? Was this a career path that you said, hey, uh, I love you know storytelling and this is what I want to do? Or, or what was that experience like kind of going into this industry? Well, it wasn't at all what I thought I would be doing. And, and um, we, we all kind of tap dance through life and, and improvise, right? And, and reality television, from, from my perspective, has always been improvised filmmaking. You know, you kind of make it up as you go along. Yeah. You can't screw this stuff, you can't guarantee, you know, certain things are going to happen. People are going to say certain things. And that's certainly been my uh, career over the, gosh, you know, almost two decades I've been doing television. But uh, no, in fact, I came out to Hollywood, so to speak, from New York, where I'd studied at uh, Columbia University's film school and had every intention of making independent films. I wanted to be a Coen brother. <laughs> I wanted to be like us. And uh, it's, it's quite a bit different. But no less thrilling for the fact that, you know, in the case of our season, I think there were 12, 16 million people tuning in every week uh, and appreciating what you were putting out. It was it was good. It's well, been it's, good. I think back to that time, we're talking about the early 2000s. Reality TV wasn't anywhere the behemoth it is today. And in many respects, you almost were part of shaping that, kind of molding that into the phenomenon that it is. Uh Survivor, of course, was the big mother load that everyone turned to. It was gigantic, enormous success and competed as well as any scripted fair in prime time. So um, there were predecessors, but The Apprentice sort of took it over the top and NBC backed it financially. As you know, it was a well-funded series. For reality TV and certainly some of the shows you've worked on, be it Apprentice or Amazing Race, it is kind of much more like guerrilla warfare. I mean, you're out there, you're right with the folks on the show experiencing the same hardships, the same long hours. I don't know, that seems like a much more complex task than being kind of your more stereotypical producer. What I do is um, conduct the reality. In every reality series, whether it's Deadliest Catch or Dancing with the Stars or The Amazing Race or even, you know, a cooking show, right? There's three versions. There's what happens, there's what gets filmed because you can't film everything. And there's what gets cut down into 43 minutes and 20 seconds squeezed between commercial (laughs) breaks. I oversee all three versions and make sure that they resemble one another in that there's some sort of truthfulness and, and clarity and authenticity to the proceedings and then try to make it as dramatic as possible. And, um, you know, it's funny because when we were working on season two, I had an opportunity when we were filming out at Silver Cup Studios in New York. I don't know if you remember that. We went over to Queens and I looked over and I had some people that I knew from back here in Los Angeles. One of them was James Gandolfini, who was playing Tony Soprano at the time. And they were filming an episode and there was Edie Falco and Tim Van Patten was the director. And they were like, what are you doing here? And I was like, <laughs> doing a reality show. I came in with my lanyards and my microphone headset and all that stuff. And I came over to say hello. And then we were just sitting down to lunch. They were filming The Sopranos, right? And Gandolfini's got his robe on and they've been filming in the kitchen set and they're shooting pages 17, 17A and revisions in pink because the script is always changing. But they, they sit around and watch these two actors work and they hope that something spontaneous and real happens. My call sheet, it just said reality. Per Bill Pruitt. 
<laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. But we had to deliver an entertainment that someone devoting their hour to would watch week after week. That would know? terrify me. Yeah, it was, it was pretty uh, excruciating at times, but also quite exhilarating, too, to see things unfold naturally, organically, and authentically. And then with a bit of, uh, you know, sleight of hand editing, present things in a truthful way that amped up that drama was really quite extraordinary. And it has been the whole time. Well, you say present things in a truthful way. You know, how do you feel about the folks that are constantly saying, you know, oh, you didn't see the real story, this, that, the other thing, or it was editing and this kind of thing? What's kind of your response there? We'd have to remember that, you know, the fired contestant would be going on the Today Show to promote the show and discuss their downfall. And the same thing with Amazing Race over on CBS. You know, contestants would show up in the morning after their episode premiered and talk about their downfall. And it had to be consistent with what happened. But if you were completely untruthful in your depiction of that person, they were going to call you out on the Today Show. And that was not that was not going to be a good thing. And you just had to really honor that. And we have. And I've taken that to every single series I've done. Because if it's not the Today Show or some morning news show, it's going to be in the press somewhere. You yeah. Know, how they feel about their depiction. Is there anything that you've ever seen in your time or even done personally that you have looked back on with hindsight and said that wasn't quite what happened there was a, uh, a series that I created for Discovery Channel called Weed Country. Discovery at the time had a series called Moonshiners on that was quite successful, still on. And I think they wanted a, a, a Moonshiners for weed. And, and so all of a sudden we found ourselves creating these ornate cat and mouse sequences where it looked like the cops were chasing down this particular grower when in fact they weren't, they were looking for somebody else. But we, mm. in our edit, made it look as though they were looking for these guys. And we fastened together these gigantic cliffhangers, you know, what's going to happen? Oh, golly, you know, stay tuned. Yeah. And the whole thing just felt sort of disingenuous. And I don't think it did anybody, law enforcement or the growers or the viewers, any good. This brings up a really good question that I kind of always have when watching, you know, a show like Moonshiners. And that is, how do these people do illegal acts on camera? And not get caught. I mean, they're literally on camera. Uh, We were filming people on weed country, you know, engaged in illegal acts. Granted, one of them was doing it, he thought, in a benevolent way, creating a uh, a cannabis oil that would be used to uh, administer to a child who suffered from 10 to 12 epileptic seizures a day, right? Mm -hmm. What this character was doing, he was um, subjecting himself to a five-year minimum federal prison term if he was caught. And he's depicting it all realistically and talking about it on camera. And uh, the child's mother, who happened to be a postdoctorate researcher in, in neuroscience at Stanford, had come to him for this very reason, to, to help treat her child, who went from 10 to 12 a day to one a month. And we captured all of that and depicted it in the uh, series. But knowing full, fully well that this could bring the guy down, uh, when in fact he stole one of our PA's uh, Land Rovers and drove off to Canada with uh, Miss New Times and had a child and we have not heard from him again. <laughs> so That's insane. So he shot the show and at the end he just stole a Land Rover and drove to Canada and had a baby? Yeah, I mean it was an early model Land Rover. I don't want to make it sound like it was a brand new Range Rover, but Still. yeah, he disappeared on everybody. Uh, he did abscond with my PA's Land Rover. This I know to be true. So. <laughs> careful what you wish for. I feel like there's a book in you. A- a- any chance that uh, when you finally hang up your megaphone or whatever it is that you guys use, that that, they'll, that you'll write a book? So incredible that we're talking about this. I actually am putting a spit shine on a collection of short stories. But I have a friend who is a, a book editor in Paris, and she was looking it over for me. And she was like, you know, a couple of these ring really true. And I'm like, yeah, they kind of are verbatim. You know, I took <laughs> some liberties. But uh, she said, you should write a book, a memoir. And talk about this because the fact is, you know, when you do what I do for a living, you're manipulating reality, right? You're manipulating situations and people and and you're exercising a certain degree of psychology in, in all of it. And it can really mess with you. It can really turn your reality into a weird sort of nightmare. And I've been through some crazy personal stuff, but when you engage in a documentary type of of enterprise, 
and you have to manipulate it. You need to be really careful that you're not manipulating the actual circumstances related to your life <laughs> yeah. because otherwise you'll wind up as I have, you know, in a divorce. And so as a cautionary tale, yeah, I might bang out a book and just go, you know, there by the grace of God. <laughs> I don't know. That's really interesting. It- Do you find that you found yourself kind of constructing or manipulating the reality around you or were is it that you were concerned or hyper vigilant that people were constructing your reality? Both, Hmm. honestly. That would be a very uncomfortable way to exist. Well, yeah, (laughs) we all want to be authentic and we all want to be true to ourselves. But, uh, you know, it's weird when you when you engage in a uh, an outlook this is going to sound psychopathic and I have no intention of coming across. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very confident you're not a psychopath at this point. So, so feel free. <laughs> but your listeners may not uh, understand. No, it's just, it's a, it's a weird thing. It's, it, it, you know, to, to spend the brunt of one's life, you know, in dark rooms with editors, manipulating a, a, a moment, a real moment, so that it comes across as entertaining. That can trickle over into your everyday life. And I think it's been a struggle that I and some of my peers have, have faced, you know, with, with, what look okay i'll just tell you when i was going through my divorce i seemed to be signing up for every single series that had deadliest in the title (laughs) subconscious coming through you know and not that i had a death wish by any stretch but i needed to push the boundaries of what life was and would be for me uh you race cars so you know what the exhilaration of you know that can can be like for you on a regular basis, you know, the tingling nerve sensation that you get. Yeah. So to have that constantly come into your life and then recede uh, abruptly when you go back to the edit room and you've stood on the deck of a boat in 40 foot waves with ex-felons on board and then, you know, retreated back to Burbank to put it all together. That's a, that's a seesaw that I wouldn't r- wish on my worst enemy. It's just yeah. it's really trying. And there's some manipulation in that too. You know? So If your life for you is constantly going around on the most exciting aspects of life or adventure or being on the edge, which is what people want to see, how coming back to a normal life and walking in and saying, hi, honey, what's for dinner could could become very mundane and almost boring. Well, I would start out by asking you, what's a normal, stable existence, right? (laughs) If I were to go Good point. You know, uh, devote my time to a cubicle yeah. uh, that allowed me to get home at five o'clock so I could have a regularly scheduled dinner with my two sons, you know, that would probably be in its own form uh, insanity mm-hmm. if I wasn't true to myself and my you know, need for a, a, adventure and excitement. And what I have come to realize over the years, and I've got two sons now, you know, into their 20s. Um, they want to do what I do. They've seen me go out and see the world, paid to learn and engage in, in unique worlds. And now I think the biggest compliment I've been afforded beyond Emmy Awards is that they both want to do what I do. They recognize what it's done for me uh, personally and professionally. Where it got dicey was you know, in the uh, personal relationship I had with you know, my beloved wife, she and I just basically grew apart. And yeah. that was a, a byproduct. But uh, no, I think it's all relative, right? And we all make choices. And there's regrets, but not not that many with regard to that, because it's a life lived. Shifting gears a little bit, you've obviously worked with a lot of celebrities as well as, you know, everyday people and reality stars. Is there anyone that you've come across that you're like, wow, this person is really an a-hole or, you know, just not a good person? Well, uh, Donald Trump. (laughs) (laughs) uh, We had a big job trying to make this guy look like he was a uh, business titan. He certainly had been, but his fortunes were declining when The Apprentice came along. And uh, comments that I overheard, behavior I observed, I associated with the dark triad, right? The psychopathic, Machiavellian narcissist. And that behavior is befitting of, you know, anybody in business or entertainment who needs to elbow their way to the top, right? And then there's something to be said for that kind of thing, you know? But when it comes down to, and look, at I've, I've interviewed Hillary Clinton, and I feel more humanity coming forth from a Donald Trump than I ever did from Hillary Clinton, in that she just struck me as completely robotic, right? 
But um, Trump at least had some sense of humanity, not a good human. But uh, so it's no secret how I feel about um, our current president. And and it's beyond the mea culpa of, hey, we helped create this character and yeah. put his platform forward. The way he is toward women and some of his uh, attitudes toward you know, people unlike himself yeah. uh, is is really despicable. And I would have no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me fill people in who may not be familiar with what happened, although it was kind of a big news story at the time. We have to go back to during the election. This was, I think, right after the Access Hollywood tapes came out with Billy Bush and, you know, the now infamous grab him by the whatnot. And you put out a tweet and I'll read it here so that people have a frame of reference. As a producer on seasons one and two of The Apprentice, I assure you, when it comes to the Trump tapes, there are far worse. Hashtag just the beginning. Yeah. Um, none of us thought in a million years that Donald Trump would ever become president of the United States. And I understand why people wanted that. I, I know the sentiment behind a Trump supporter. I've got friends who are Trump supporters. But at the time, it just all seemed fairly ridiculous. And, and maybe it was a, a desperate move on my part, but it was authentic to say that when it came to uh, The Apprentice and the Trump tapes, there were far worse. Because as you recall, we, we had everyone wearing radio mics. Yep. People were recorded, as you've mentioned in other podcasts, you know, 24-7. Well, you know, Mr. Trump was no less uh, subjected to that. We'd, we'd turn his microphone off. We'd have confidential conversations. But because it's an FCC-regulated game show, some of those conversations were purposefully recorded, you know, evidence that we could share if anyone rolled up on us and said, hey, you guys told him who to fire. We never did. We never told Donald Trump who to fire. We couldn't. So my feeling was that there were conversations that were recorded where he said things and, you know, we all reacted. And, uh, well, and yeah. you're you're under probably a pretty strict NDA, as as I'm sure I am at some point. Obviously, I wasn't privy to the information you are or were. At what point when you came on to The Apprentice, did you kind of do almost like a like a double take? Whoa, did I just hear what came out of that person's mouth? Well, before we even began rolling, I felt things were different than what we were portraying publicly. We all knew it. We knew what the job was, you know, in order to justify everybody wanting to work for him, we had to prop him up to be this, you know, zillionaire, right? Yet the carpets were rotting at the Taj Mahal and furniture in his office on the, you know, 50th floor or whatever of Trump Tower was dinged and scraped and rough. And, you know, it just, it was all, you know, we had to look past that stuff. We had to make a big deal out of the gilded uh, escalator ride in the apartment and, you know, the furnishings and whatnot and look away from the things that weren't as people might see them. Well, I was just kind of curious at, at what point kind of the curtain was pulled back for you and you saw someone that was maybe different from what the public saw. Well, anytime you spend a fair amount of time with somebody, you get to see what most people don't get to see. And Donald Trump is and has always been a, a rather tall, charismatic figure right? He just is, is larger than life in so many ways. And I think it makes him to some people very, very appealing. He walks the earth like few others. That, that can be said, you know, commendably almost, right? But when I heard things said during season one by him is when I began to realize that, you know, this, this is, if this ever got out or if this became known, it could affect the success of the series. I don't think you can say specifically what was said, but in your opinion, if these things that were said were to be known, do you think there would be a reaction at this point? Sadly, no. You know, he said himself, I could go and shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and no one would care. I think we're at that point. I really, I, I really do. Do you, well, let me ask more specifically, if you, if you can't say what was said, was it sexist uh, comments in your view or racist or can you not comment? I cannot really comment. You know, it's funny. I got a call out of the blue from Omarosa. I haven't spoken to Omarosa since we did season two. I think she came back and she worked for Trump and she worked for Trump in the White House, as everyone knows, and got evicted. <laughs> um, she brought up the NDA. And she said, you know, you were you were speaking your truth. And, and listen, I don't know 
Omarosa. I don't know that, you know, I, I, I trust her, but we were, we were friendly and respected one another. But her conversation was basically, look, I should have followed your lead on that. I didn't. And I was like, well, go write a book, you know, <laughs> like, do what you got to <laughs> do. She's like, I can't. The NDA is so daunting. And it is. You signed one. You know what it's like. I want to interrupt real quickly with an editor's note. Obviously, Bill and I have to be very careful about what we say due to the NDAs that we have in place with NBC and The Apprentice, of which Donald Trump is an executive producer. There's a podcast called Embedded by NPR, and they actually did a really in-depth piece about The Apprentice as a whole. I think it came out um, October of this year. And they actually interviewed Bill about the tapes and what was on them. And I want to play that for you now. Again, this is NPR's Embedded with Kelly McKivers. Was it just about women? Mostly no, about women? Very, very much a, a racist issue. It was about race? Yeah. About African-Americans, Jewish mm-hmm. people, all the above? Mm-hmm. Yep. And was it just him? I mean, were other, you know, was it sort of a Billy Bush situation where it was like, yeah, man, I know what you mean. Like other people talking that way too? Like, uh, was it a culture of the place? No, no. I think when you heard these things, there's the audible gasp, you know, that is quickly followed by a cough, kind of like, huh? you know, and then, <clears throat> yes, and, uh, anyway, you know, and then you just sort of carry on. Again, that clip was from NPR's Embedded. That was a story they did about Donald Trump and The Apprentice. It's called Trump Stories, The Apprentice. Uh, It's a fantastic episode, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Now back to our interview. What was the working environment like if things are said that are uncomfortable to people? Obviously, there were producers that were female there. There were producers or, or, or probably people back end that were people of color. What does that do to a working environment if things are said that are heard by all and now they have to interact with? Did people just shut their mouths and suck it up because it was a little bit of a different time? Or did people get uncomfortable? People got uncomfortable. Um, There was, um, you know, uh, that kind of uncomfortable cough, cough, you know, you heard that too, right? Kind of thing in our roles and whatnot. And then you, you know, gather in the elevator afterwards and either, you know, descend to your production office or out onto the street for a cup of coffee. And, and, you know, the exchange is wow. But look, we also go to work and the job entails this, you know, 800 pound gorilla. Yeah, it's complicated, you know, and sometimes you just go back to the apartment they're putting you up in and you, you, you know, smack your head and you wonder where. Do a little soul searching. Well, you also didn't think that you were creating, and I don't want to blame you for this, but you didn't think that that by not focusing on a certain aspect of his personality that he would someday lead the free world. No, at all. Never once did yeah. we think that. Yeah. A lot of people have said those tapes will never see the light of day because Trump is um, an executive producer on The Apprentice um, and therefore has some level of control. But there's a lawsuit. Have you heard about this lawsuit? It's from an Apprentice contestant. I wasn't familiar with her, but she was after my time. Summer Zervos? Yeah, I've heard about that. She was after my time as well. Apparently, she claims that there was sexual harassment while she was on The Apprentice. And that it very well may have been taped if the mics are running the majority of the time, which they are. Uh, And she is uh, going to court. This is the latest uh, article I have is from uh, June 5. And she's suing to get those tapes released, or at least all tapes that she is on. So it'll be interesting to see what transpires there. It's interesting. Tom Arnold, who was one of the uh, celebrity contestants, has uh, joined up with Viceland to go on the hunt for the tapes and the producers keep calling me and going, you know, do you know, do you know? And I'm like, no, but Tom does. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there may something, something may come of that, but at the same time, as we discussed, I don't think it's going to matter whatever comes out. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's going to matter if it comes out or not, but it is interesting. I, I am, of course, curious to to see if the tapes ever do see the light of day. Anyway, I want to transition right now. What is the hardest show you've worked on physically? I mean, I had a lot of people who have always seen Amazing Race. Oh, I would love to be on The Amazing Race. And I would sit there and go, I would hate to be on The Amazing Race. It looks like just a marathon of torture. Definitely physically the hardest thing I've ever done. You live out of a mini backpack for 29 days 
You get no sleep except for on airplane rides. And uh, yet you see more of the world in those 29 days than people see in a lifetime. And then you get to do it again later in the year. It was extraordinary. I did eight seasons. Why and, on uh, earth? Are you a masochist? Why on earth would you do eight seasons? Well, you know, it's funny because when I first got on the series, I was I was running around with a notebook and a BlackBerry. And camera guys are hauling these gigantic ENG cameras yeah. and their sound guys carry all the batteries for the camera and nothing else. And I thought, my God, they must be paying them so much freaking money to do this. But in fact, you come to learn that they do it for the thrill, for the enjoyment, because the challenge is so extraordinary. Hmm. And why I think that series continues to win Emmy Awards is because the viewers can see the love. They can see the passion that the filmmakers and the contestants all have for this experience, for this adventure. Yeah, there's a million bucks waiting at the end of it for somebody. That just keeps it all urgent and real. But you're seeing things and doing things. And, and the fact is, you know, what we cut down into 43 minutes and 20 seconds barely compares, barely compares to what is actually going on because there's long nights sleeping on the street at altitude in La Paz, Bolivia, or out in some rainforest somewhere where the bugs are biting and, you know, you just have no idea watching that series. The outtakes would be extraordinary unto themselves. Talk about, you know, hidden tapes. Yeah. My God. Yeah, it's a blast to do, though. Definitely. Were, were you ever, was there ever a time where you were actually either you or you felt like the contestants were in real danger? Probably the most dangerous example I remember was in Morocco when these two African-American gentlemen, one was a firefighter and one was a cop, and they were friends from here in Los Angeles. And uh, they got a clue in, in Marrakesh saying, go to the Catalina Riyadh and you'll find your next clue. And it was actually going to be the pit stop. It was the final destination in this long leg. And when they got the clue, they went to a cab driver and said, Catalina Riyadh, Catalina Riyadh. And he took them out of town, out of Marrakesh, about 35 kilometers, town called Riyadh. And they got out of the taxi cab, these two big black guys with wraparound shades, and white sneakers and went running around looking for the Catalina Riyadh, Catalina Riyadh, and wound up running into a women's mosque in the center of town where all these women happened to be praying at the time. You first of all don't go in there as a gentleman. Secondly, you don't go in there looking like, you know, something out of, uh, you know, a spaceship or something, you know, <laughs> sure. the, the sorts and whatnot they were wearing. The whole town just blew up and people came out and grabbed the cameraman and, and told us all to sort of step to the side and we were going to be incarcerated and arrested and, you know, serious repercussions. But, you know, the cavalry came in, we called our uh, security personnel and they came in and, and calmed everybody down and through language barriers and whatnot. And it was extraordinary, but uh, barely made air. I want to be respectful of your time, but I got a couple more quick ones. One, I was curious, did you ever hear about the show that was supposed to go on in Russia? They wanted to do a real Hunger Games in Siberia <laughs> where they got like 20 contestants. You had a month. And the, the sole survivor won $1.6 million. I have not heard of that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I read about this. It's called, you should check it out. It's called Game 2 Winter. Uh, I don't think it ever got off the ground because at some point someone pointed out that wouldn't they still be subject to Russian law? At which point the producers finally said, well, yeah, you know, if you kill like 10 people, we won't hold you accountable, but the government probably still will. <laughs> What is your favorite show that's kind of undiscovered out there? What is a show that you watch and you're just kind of blown away by how good it is, but people may not have found it yet? Well, for the past several years, I've been gravitating away from competition reality series to documentary series, you know, that are structured almost like scripted shows, but that have this raw and real feel to them uh, because they're actually, after all, about real people. There's a series on Netflix called Flint Town that has done extraordinary things as, uh, with its storytelling. Its visuals are, are off the chain. But um, the three, four directors embedded for two and a half years with the Flint, Michigan Police Department and captured an incredible array of characters. And it wasn't about the water crisis. I thought it would be more so. It's about America. It's about a, a community inside America that reflects outward onto a larger picture of how we are toward one another with respect to race, politics, government, protection, safety, and fear. And they went to all of it and got it beautifully. I think it's going to show up at the Emmy Awards in a big way. 
Is Netflix the best thing to happen to TV in your mind, or do you have a different view? I have I have a different view, but I can't really go into that because I just finished a series with them. And <laughs> the experience, the shared experience of um, event television is being lost via Netflix. You can watch it anytime, anywhere, right? That's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. But the fact is, you know, when, when Scandal or The Amazing Race or some, something that you love to watch comes on every week at an appointed hour and you can't wait to see it, you know, that the ability to sit down and, and have that experience with your family, that's fading fast. And I miss that. I'm old enough to know what that was like. Yeah. Well, I love the bingeability of Netflix and its offerings. Uh, I, I miss the, the opportunity to sit down for a scheduled event. And almost even worse, in my marriage, I find that the access, the constant access to be able to watch anything at any time is almost causes a conflict. Whereas before, when we would have a show, my wife and I would have a show that we loved and we would kind of get together and, and watch it at a given time and it would be a shared experience and something really fun to look forward to. Now, it's if something good comes out, we're so busy. If one of the two of us watches it without the other, it's like, what? How did you want? You're supposed to wait for me. And so it almost becomes like a conflict in a marriage. Yeah. No, I, 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 I've i had this conversation with my girlfriend. Where it's like, we're, you're cheating on me. You wouldn't watch that without. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, these viewing habits and, and how, you know, you can compile a list of programs you want to see, right? Because you're just going to get to it eventually. They're going to be there. It's not like you're going to miss it if it if it doesn't, if you don't catch it when it first airs. It's all there. It's all being offered. But you can spend an hour looking through all the offerings, all the different on-screen tiles, right, that you can click on to see what you're going to watch tonight. And it's a big waste of time. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly, I can, I can speak to that personally. Yeah. Okay, last couple here. What is the best advice? This is something I ask everyone that comes on the show. Uh, what is the best advice that anyone has ever given you? I, I mean, this, the, the best was the simplest, which was pay attention, you know, um, be alert, of anticipating behavior before it happens. Being alert to those moments has made my program so much more successful because I, I took that advice. But it carries out in so many other ways too, you know? Look at trends that are happening in your business. Being alert, I think, would be the best advice. Be alert, be aware, yeah. Last one, when you finally sign off someday long, long in the future, what will you be most proud of or what do you want to make sure you have accomplished? Oh, man. Again, John, big questions. Um, when I directed theater in New York, I did it with a band of actors and designers and whatnot. And we sold tickets for 10 bucks a head. And we just imagined that the one guy who came to our theater brought his last $10 and came 50 miles on foot to watch what we were putting forth. We, we, we dedicated ourselves every night to making sure that that was the idea in our minds with our intention, right, of what we were putting forth. I just hope that somewhere along the line, somebody sat down to watch something that I collaborated on, that they took 45 minutes of their night to dedicate to something I did and enjoyed themselves like they would a good meal or a piece of music. Because after all, that's, that's you know, the greatest joy. That hour to that person's day becomes that hour to that person's life, and maybe it's made it a little bit better. And I think that is a fantastic way to conclude, because I know that you have done that in many aspects. I want to thank you so much for being here today. I know that after all of the Trump stuff, you were inundated with interview requests, but you accepted to come on this show and do that for us. So Thanks, John. Yeah, it wasn't the barrel of laughs you had with Bradford, but uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed the conversation with you, my friend. Definitely. Well, I'm sure at some point I may have to call you back and ask if there is actual tape of uh, Russo, as he said, Carvin in the, in the suite. <laughs> <laughs> I'll dig it up. If, gonna, if there's a if, Trump tape to be found, it's that one. If you can dig it up, I will play the audio very uncomfortably. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Bill. That's our show for today. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Wildcard. See live podcasts and pics from the show on Instagram and Facebook, or visit us online at wildcardshow.com. 